And well, hello everybody. My name is Will. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to welcome you to Two Rivers Church. Who's glad to be here, somebody? Yeah, come on. That's so good. Well, I want to welcome you to week number two of Advent Conspiracy. Uh, and I do want to take just a second to look right into the camera, and I want to tell you that I love you. I care about you. I'm so glad that you're here. I have been praying for you. I pray for everybody at, at all of our locations. Love you guys so much. Super proud of you. Proud of all the teams that are uh, making it happen week in and week out. Loving on your communities. Making a difference right where you are. God sees it. And I want you to know that he always, always, always rewards faithfulness. And so I want to encourage you in that. And, and so I want to just say thank you. And I want to welcome all of our locations in Cortland, Corning, Ithaca, Gloversville, and Binghamton. Come on, church, let's put our hands together, make them feel welcome and loved on. Love you guys. A uh, couple things that I want to celebrate that I didn't get a chance to do uh, as our community pastors preached week number one of the Advent Conspiracy Live this last week, but I do want to celebrate the Freedom Conference. Such a beautiful time as people gathered together here, and uh, just God did so much good work, and I keep hearing reports of that. And listen, if God did something good in your heart on your respond card, if you would just take that out and just share a little bit of what God did in the Freedom Conference, I would love to be able to share that with the team and kind of put that back through, because a lot of people really went the extra mile for that conference to make that happen, and so I'd love to be able to share those reports of what God did in your heart. So if you could just take a moment, write that down, and then at the end of the experience, just drop that in the offering bucket. It'd be awesome. And then uh, just uh, we had on the uh, last Sunday in November, 30 people were baptized in water. So that was just amazing what God's doing, all the people that are coming to know the Lord. I'm still celebrating that. So good. Such a beautiful thing to see. And uh, contrary to popular opinion, I do like Christmas. It's a wonderful season. I had a Christmas song on today. People stopped by the office and were like, what is going on in here? This guy's listening to Christmas music. And, and so I, I love Christmas. Christmas is big, right? It's like, I, it's so big that it started back in August. I just fight it until the day after Thanksgiving. Then I get in. I'm in now, everybody. We're having Christmas now. It's all right. So, so and that's my, pr my prayer for you this season is that you would celebrate Christmas, Christ Mass, as a Christian, L like a, a little Christ. And so that I, I'm praying that our lives at every location is going to radiate Jesus in this season in, in that the season in which he is the most celebrated, right? And so it's so beautiful as, as we go into this season and it's just this beautiful opportunity now to invite our friends, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, people that would never go to church. They're gonna come with you on December 22nd to a Two Rivers Christmas. And if you can't get them there for that, they're gonna fly in specifically so you can bring them to the Christmas Eve experience at five o'clock at all the locations and uh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. So I know uh, you're in prayer about that. I'm in prayer about that, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do this Christmas as we lift him up. Well, we are in this series entitled Advent Conspiracy, and the whole idea of this series, uh, Advent just means uh, the, the coming of something, or it's like the awaited expectation or the arrival, the Advent. And then conspiracy is uh, it's what you do when you put tinfoil on your head. And, and then you, there's, it's, that's not what happens with conspiracies. It's this, this idea of people coming together to secretly and uh, in some ways subversively do something that the broad populace does not know about. So the Advent conspiracy is this idea that as Christians, we're going to gather together this Christmas to do something that's a little bit countercultural. It's going to be a little bit subversive to what our culture is in our approach to this season. So, so the whole idea, the, the, the whole thing that we're going to do this Christmas is we're going to worship fully. We're going to spend less. We're going to talk about that today. Then we're going to give more. 
and then we're going to love all. And these are, you're going to see how this is really a subversive, countercultural type of thing. But I think it is important to us as Christians that as we step out to look like Jesus, to celebrate Jesus, Christmas is so big. I mean, this thing is so big. It is a cultural phenomenon. Like I've been, I've been to India. They celebrate Christmas in India. I've been to Vietnam. They're celebrating Christmas in Vietnam. They celebrate Christmas all around the world. And so it creates for us this opportunity to express something to our culture. And I want to make sure as Christians we're expressing who Jesus is to our culture. If you guys agree with that, say, I'm with it. Yeah, come on. That's so good. So last week we talked about worshiping fully. We were encouraged to guard our hearts. This idea that the heart is the wellspring of life and everything you do flows from it. And, and John the Baptist was sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for Christ. And so as we are in this season, there's some things that we need to do to guard our hearts. There's some things that we need to do to sort of prepare the way for the advent or the coming of Jesus. Because I find that in this life we get so busy, we get crowded out with, with so many things that the things that are important, the things that matter most get shoved to the side. And so, so as we enter into this Advent season, as we enter into this period of time now that we would be able to put some of those things aside so that we could worship fully. And as we worship, it will feed our heart. And there's so many ways to worship. You can go to Facebook and the Two Rivers page and you can see a blog there and, and some posts about how to worship fully and what that looks like. And if you missed that message, uh, you cannot find it online. It's not posted anywhere. So you just gotta go find those resources at Facebook. And then uh, what, what we'll be talking about this week now, what we're talking about today is spending less. So somebody turn to your neighbor at every single location and tell them, spend less. Now, now I'll tell you, this is crazy, right? Like this is super countercultural what we're talking about, spending less when it comes to Christmas. Because what's getting ready to happen over the next couple of weeks, we're about to spend a half trillion dollars in America alone on Christmas. One half of a trillion dollars, one half of trillion. Like I can't even figure out what a trillion is. If I had to write a trillion, I don't know if I could do that accurately. You know, so, so it was interesting. When I, I, I worked at, uh, before I became a pastor, I, I sold trucks for a little while. I was a juvenile officer prior to that, and I got burned out doing, doing the juvenile officer, juvenile officer thing because uh, I called it when we, we would take kids in and, and we'd adjudicate them. In other words, they were guilty of some crime. Uh, I called it a status degradation ceremony that we were saying something about who that kid was or who that person was, and it just ran so counter to what I believe in who Jesus is and, and how I believe transformation works in this world. And I believe in justice, don't get me wrong, but I also believe in redemption and restoration and, and that God changes lives and God restores, and I felt like I was in a system that could never bring hope. And so I got out of that, and I started selling cars. <laughs> like, I'm going to do something that doesn't matter at all. And, and so, so I started selling cars, and it was like, I'm going to make some money. And I was making money. I was selling cars, and uh, I was the number one truck salesman in the number one truck dealership in a six-state region in truck country, y'all. This is I'm talking about... Missouri, Oklahoma, Iowa, Kansas, like this is what it was. So I was like, we're, I was slinging vehicles. And, and this, I will never forget my first Christmas selling cars. And this lady came in and she wanted to buy her husband an FJ Cruiser for Christmas. And I thought, wow, that's a gift, right? Like if your wife brings you home an FJ Cruiser, for Christmas, that's like, ooh, I like that. That's pretty good. I, that's a good gift. How many people would be like, yes, I'm appreciative for the FJ Cruiser. 
So what was so interesting, uh, she's, we had to do, I had to do like the credit checks on everybody as they come through. And you get a little financial background, a little financial history. And this family was making like 50K a month. 50K a month. The crazy part was she couldn't get, well, we couldn't get her credit check approved. It's like you make $50,000 a month. How are you not able to get credit? It was because their credit cards were maxed through the roof. They had so much debt that she literally could not get credit. So then a couple weeks later, she came back and paid for the FJ Cruiser in cash. Woo, praise God. And so I was like, thank you, Jesus. Cha-ching, put another one on the board. And, and so that was good. I was like, we're going to have a good Christmas too. Not, not only are your, is your husband having a good Christmas, but my wife's going to have a good Christmas now. Yeah. So, so it was like, all right, we're doing good. Uh, that's Christmas, right? Like Christmas, here we come. And what was crazy was, the next Christmas goes past, and the next Monday after Christmas, the husband shows up with the FJ Cruiser to return it. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. So about a month later, he's a doctor, and he had to go up to, like, Columbia, Missouri all the time. He comes driving back, sliding. He calls me from the road. And he says, listen, I'm coming to get that FJ if it's, if it's around. I was like, not that one, but I can get you another one. Trust me. I'll have the keys ready when you're here. And he drives in in a little uh, Nissan 350Z with racing tires. He's sliding all over the road. He's like, I need that FJ Cruiser. I, I, can't drive, I can't drive my race car around. It doesn't work. So I got him that FJ anyhow. But here's the idea. <laughs> here's the idea. Uh, that's not that, like how they handled their credit. I was shocked at it. But then my wife and I, as I'm making six-figure income, we were doing the same thing. We were spending it faster than I could make it. We were running up the credit card bill as quick as I could. My parents spent a lifetime getting a home and outfitting their home, like putting furniture in the house. And we had been married like a year and we had a house, we had all of the furniture in the house, we had multiple vehicles. It was like, I bought a timeshare, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, I must get a timeshare right now. Why should I wait and then not only, and have it only at the very end of my life? I need it now. And so I have this credit mentality like, like I need it now. Does anybody ever fall prey to that I need it now kind of thing? There's only, I'm sure I'm the only one, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm the only one to ever make that mistake. But that's, that's what's happening in our culture. Right now, the average household is uh, $16,000 in credit card debt. And now what's interesting about that, not every household has credit card debt. So, so what that actually means is individually, individuals carrying credit card debt carry on average per person $9,000 in credit card debt. That's not school bills. That's not your mortgage. It's not anything else. This is unsecured credit debt. That's per person in America. The, now, here's another interesting stat. As we go into Christmas, the average American house will spend one hour per week in religious activity. This is not just for Christmas. This is all year round. Whereas at that, in that same household, we'll spend five hours per week shopping. We live in a consumer culture. In total, Americans have 974.2 billion, that's near on $1 trillion in credit card debt. They say that right now, 15 million Americans are addicted to shopping. It's an actual addiction. You go out and you're, you're fulfilling a need in yourself by shopping. Three quarters of America, three quarters, 75% of Americans view Christmas with dread. Yet we will spend a half a trillion dollars on it and we're going to generate five million tons of extra waste. It's going to take the average 
household three months to pay off Christmas. So, so this is a really interesting thing because as we're in this Advent conspiracy, what is it that we're doing, church, that reflects Jesus? What is it that we're doing that we're teaching our children about this season? And, and so what I want us to do now is I, I just want you to kind of hold that thought. In every single location, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 2. And I want us to begin kind of at the, the Christmas story, the traditional Christmas passage in Luke chapter 2. We're going to pick up with verse number 1. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus, now, now I just want to take a second to pause there because we sort of miss what that is. Caesar means king. It actually could, all, it could mean king of kings. It means, and then Augustus means exalted one. So, so you got king, exalted one. Now, this is not actually his name. Caesar Augustus is the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And he has taken on an honorific to himself. And he begins to call his father, his adopted father, a god. And this Caesar Augustus has claimed to be the son of God. In fact, he begins a cult, he begins a religion, it's emperor worship. And in, in, in this time period, there's something going on called Pax Romana. And what that is, it means the spread of Rome. And, and this is actually a good thing to the people of Rome. Because where Rome goes, it brings, as it goes into a nation, it settles the, the people, the barbarians and those who are out of law, and it brings peace to those regions. So, so Caesar Augustus is the prince of peace. The reader of this text in Luke chapter 2 is fully aware of this title, fully aware of Pax Romana, fully aware that that the only that the worship of one emperor is is designed now all of all of Rome should be worshiping the emperor and so in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world and what's the census other than to figure out how to levy taxes, to exercise control, to have the ability to spend money, to increase, to, to have the ability to expand and to do all of the things that were required in the Roman world. So verse 2, this is the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Anybody ever wants to say that Jesus didn't come, and the Bible was made up or manufactured. There's all those details, like in verse 2, that are historically verifiable. In fact, if you question the veracity of Scripture, you can go back in every single time. Archaeology has always verified the, the accounts of Scripture. In fact, archaeology has never contradicted there's people and places and things that, that, that uh, archaeologists have said they've never existed, they don't exist, and then they discover them where the Bible says it would be, when the Bible said it would be. And so verse 3, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, which you have Jesus being prophetically... Another really interesting thing about the power of Scripture is, this is these are prophecies about Jesus 
that Jesus himself has no ability to fulfill. Like, this is before he was born. So he can't engineer this to his own satisfaction. He can't come up with this on his own. Jesus himself had to be in the right place at the right time. The, there could only be one who is able to fulfill all of the prophecies. He had to be a, a Nazarene, and he had to be from Bethlehem. How could this be accomplished? And here it is. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. Jesus had to be in the line of David. Verse 5, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And that's its own thing, y'all. That's another message for another day. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn. Her firstborn. And this is the first fruits because Jesus is going to be offered as the sacrifice for our sins. The firstborn of every male offspring had to be redeemed. The firstborn had to be given as a sacrifice and it would cover everything else. And that's what Jesus is to us. He was sacrificed, redeeming us, covering all those to follow. A firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Verse 8, and they were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping a watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. I want everybody to say Lord. Lord. This is a sign to you. You're going to find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And that's definitely going to be a sign what Lord is found in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, not singing, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened which the Lord has told us about. And so, so I think there's times that we can get very familiar with the Christmas passage. Like you can read through that. You've probably heard it. If you've been in the church for any amount of time, you've heard that over and over and over again. But you're probably not familiar with this idea of Pax Romana. You're probably not familiar with this idea that in that passage you see two kings You see the birth of Jesus, who's going to be king. He's going to be Lord. And yet, at the very beginning, it says, Caesar Augustus. And if you lived in this time frame, you would be well aware. You would be so aware that there can only be one king. That in the world that they lived in, there was not room for more than one king. Now, you could have King Agrippa, but King Agrippa was a vassal to Caesar Augustus, a lesser king. And, And so what happens is, as we read through this, I think we can miss that God has created an incredible amount of tension in Luke chapter 2. That there is this subversive, countercultural conflict that's being set up. It's like fight night. And what you have in one corner is the king of the earth, Caesar Augustus, and in the other corner, the king of heaven. Yet when you look at the tail of the tape, everything looks backwards. Because the measurements are. Jesus is born in a manger wrapped in cloth, couldn't even find a hotel room to stay in. Over here you have Caesar Augustus, who's in Rome, 
the greatest city in all the world. All the lineage, all the patronage, all the money, all the power, all the resources. Who himself claims to be King Glorious, Son of God. He's saying, you have to pay your taxes to me. That Jesus' father actually had to come, his mother actually had to come and go from the town they were in to another town based on the decree of Caesar Augustus. That the God that was with them brought peace everywhere by spreading Rome everywhere. You're talking about this amazing thing that as the readers read this, already Judaism had lost its position within culture and they were no longer able to freely worship and Christianity was a subset of Judaism and they're already being persecuted. They're already being blamed for Rome being burned. They're already being brought to the stadiums where they're being consumed by lions. They're already being whipped. They're already being beaten. They're already being hung on crosses, lining the Appian Way. They're already the outcast in the scourge of culture is this group of people who are claiming that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because there's only room for one king. And so there's this amazing conflict that's set up. There cannot be two kings. And so you have this this entrance, this subversive underground culture that's springing up in the face of absolute power. The first advent. And that's what I'm challenging us to in this Advent season. I'm challenging us to an underground, subversive movement in the style, in the authenticity of who Jesus was. Because if you're taking notes, there's only room enough for one king. Everybody say one. Now, I don't know if you've heard this before, but Jesus himself said you can, no man can serve two masters. You can either serve God or you can serve mammon or money. But you can't serve them both. And what's interesting is we don't live in the year one. We live in the year 2019. In America. And and what the subversive conspiracy is that, that we can bring to Christmas this year, or should I say the subversive conspiracy that Christmas brings to us, is this idea that maybe there's not a Caesar who's saying, hey, I'm the great and glorious one, but there is another king in our culture, and it's called consumerism. That our culture bows down. And, and, and we have this thing where we put around us all the material things that we can buy. Because, because even though we don't necessarily, like, we don't leave Jesus behind to do this. We don't, we don't walk away from Jesus. But we think we can have two masters with this, don't we? Because, because consumerism has some of the earmarks of what religion promises or what Jesus promises because we approach material things and we think if we can buy or have some, so like everything that's material has meaning attached to it. Like if I buy a car, I'm not just buying a car, I'm buying an identity. If I'm wearing clothing, I'm attaching to myself not just something to cover my nakedness, is something that's creating an image that I want people to believe about me. The tech, even the technology that we wear or we employ says something about our identity, our status, our image, and we are created in God's image, not in the image of stuff. 
And, and so, so what's happening is there's this trade-off that's suddenly occurring within our culture that we are pickled in it. America is pickled in the giant that was once Rome is now consumerism. That there's actually pressure for us to have to buy more stuff. Consumerism has made its way right into the church. We've been trained to be customers of the church. If the church doesn't do what we want, doesn't provide the right messaging, doesn't look the right way or match my identity, then we're going to leave it and we're going to shop for one that's going to meet our consumer needs. Like we don't stop worshiping Jesus, but we just push him off the throne a little bit. We attempt to worship both God and money. So functionally, what we're pursuing is identity, security, fulfillment, or meaning in the things that we have or buy. And every time that thing goes obsolete and the next thing comes available, you know what it is? We actually are glad that it's gone because now there's the hope that if I buy the next thing that it will satisfy And I just want us to be a little bit aware of the culture that we live in. And I want us to be a little bit aware that, that there can only be one king. That there is a countercultural, revolutionary thing that Jesus came to do that set him apart from the culture around him in church. I want us to be countercultural. I want us to create an advent conspiracy in our hearts that begins to recognize that the culture around me may not be healthy for me. It may not be healthy for my children. It may not be what God intends as we begin to teach the next generation. It may not be God, what God intends for me. And if you're taking notes, this is why. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. You just figure that out. Eat all the candy. <laughs> Find out if all the candy is a good thing. My daughter regularly informs me of all the ways I'm not parenting well. <clears throat> Why, just this morning, I had to put her on the bus, and she said, Daddy, take me to, take me to school. I said, no, you're going to ride the bus. She says, I hate the bus. I said, well, you're going to ride the bus. She said, when I'm a parent, my kids will never have to ride the bus. I said, your kids are going to be weak. <laughs> They're going to be fat and lazy and incapable. <laughs> you're going to ride the bus, and it's going to make you stronger. And she said, no, it's not. I said, yes, it will. Trust me. <laughs> you're going to get better. It's a, but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. This is actually a systemic problem in parenting in our culture today. Because parents are giving in to every whim and whimsy of their children. And it's actually causing them to become weak. Like our children are ill prepared to go to college because we've helicopter parented them. We never let them skid in their knees. We never let them lose. We never let them go through difficulty or trial. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. It's interesting because if you turn in, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, there's this really interesting passage in Luke 14 too. You probably skimmed right over this and missed this. But too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. This, this man in, in Luke chapter 14 is sick. He's come to Jesus, and it says there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. This is called dropsy. And that's not when you drop things. It's when your body takes on too much water. And water's a good thing. Any, anyone in basic science knows that, that your body is mostly water. That's a good thing. Until there's too much. And now he's sick, and his body's filling, his, filling with water, and, and it's making up this, it's making him sick. And so in verse 4, Jesus real simply, he sees, he sees the man, he takes a hold of him, he healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus simply heals him. He wants 
to take that which is too much and make it right. And, and so there's this pressure building up on people for Christmas to spend, spend, spend. It's your patriotic duty. You must go out and spend to make sure that our country is doing well. And what's interesting in Mark chapter 10, you see another story where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus looks at him and, he's, and, and he says, well, you got to keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, Lord, I've kept all the commandments from the time of my birth. And then in verse 21, it says something very interesting. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Everybody say loved him. And he says to him now, because of his love for him, he says, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And this is a verse that pretty much we recoil to read. Like I don't know too many people that have sold everything they had. And it's actually not a requirement of Jesus in order to be saved. It's not... But for this man, Jesus had a test. Jesus had a test. And what's interesting is the test for him was born of Jesus' love for him. Is it possible this year, church, that this Christmas, Jesus' love for us, saying, hey, it might be healthy for us to have a little bit less. It might be okay and I know this is radical, right? Like, like this is like, wait, whoa, what are my neighbors going to think? What are my kids going to think? And that is the question, isn't it? Because we've been told your kids can't have a good Christmas unless you have lots and lots and lots and lots of gifts. And, and my question is, what if we could learn to celebrate God's arrival in this world in a way that looks more like Jesus? Right? Like, how many gifts did Jesus get? Three. This seemed good. But you know what was so good about those three gifts? This is, I'm not saying you can't give gifts. I'm just saying give better gifts. Right? Like, become more meaningful in the gifts that we give. And, and so the invitation this Christmas starts with what if we could learn to celebrate God's arrival in, in a world in a way that looks more like Jesus? What if we simply started by resisting the empire of capitalism, reject the consumer identity, and embrace our connection to Jesus and spend less? Like, I don't, I don't know what that would look like for you. But I think we could just start with a really simple idea. And spending less, less might mean stop spending money you don't have. Right? Like, what if you trusted in the Lord that he would provide for you and your children? What if, what if you started trusting in the Lord that he has provided, he's my Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider, he supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory, that what I have from him is enough. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There's a whole different culture that we need to teach our children. And that culture isn't that the gifts that they get on Christmas morning satisfy. Because they won't. I know. I played with the boxes, not the toys. <laughs> you know? Like, it's amazing. Because what was amazing about the boxes was that my dad got down on the floor and started putting them together and cut holes in them and made tunnels out of them. And that became the most beautiful thing that I had ever seen. And I played with the boxes. But there's a Jesus... A father in heaven that sees what you need and wants to cover you and he wants to provide for you, but there's got to be this countercultural kind of throwing off of what our culture said because we've been pickled in consumerism. We don't even see it, we're not even aware of it. It slipped right into the church. 
What are others going to think about you? If your consumer identity is not in the things that surround you, maybe you just cut your Christmas budget. Maybe just buy fewer gifts. The point's not so that you could be like, well, like I'm going to spend less in a greedy sort of way, like Scrooge. <laughs> you know, like you're going to have Ebenezer Scrooge. I, don't, I didn't spend anything this Christmas. Praise God, I'm just like Jesus. That's not the idea, right? That's not, that's not what we're going for here. What we're going for is not to be like spending less in a greedy sort of way so that we can have more for ourselves. The point is to spend less so we can have more freed up to use it in a reflection of Christ as one of his followers. We're a generous people. And, and imagine what it would look like for us to shift from loving things and using people to using things and loving people. Like if, if we spend less, we'll still be giving gifts. We're just going to be giving better gifts. And we're going to talk about that next week. How to, how to give more. How to be more intentional. How to give more of our time. Give more of ourselves. To be present. Not to give presents, but to give presents. And, and so at a Two Rivers Christmas, on the 22nd, we're going to collect some of that money. We're, gonna, we're not going to spend it on randomness. We're going to give it, we're going to pool it together as a church from all of our locations. And then we're going to use it for those who are in desperate need. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're taking on a care point in Ecuador or Honduras. We're taking on kids in Royal Family Kids Camp. We're taking on the orphans and the widows. We're going to take care of those who are in need and we're going to bless them. And I promise you, your kids are going to get excited about that. It's going to be amazing. So, so here's what I want us to do. I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want us to begin to consider what it might look like for me to challenge this idea of consumerism in my life, that this king that's ruled over my life, maybe I've been serving two lords, but this Christmas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate in this conspiracy, this advent, this coming of Christ. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider what it might look like to counterculturally live as a Christian that looks different than the culture around me. There's going to be something different in my home. There's going to be something different with our children. There's going to be something different in how we function. I want us to be able to participate in that and do that. Let me pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you did come, that there was a power encounter. There's this conflict that was set up as you came. And Jesus, we give our allegiance to you. And we give you permission to root out of us everything that doesn't belong. And God, we want to look like you. We want to follow you. We want to talk like you. And God, expose everything in us that doesn't belong to you. We thank you for it now. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that you gave yourself completely and wholly so that we could be redeemed. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said... Amen. Come on, put it together. It's so good. It's so good.